Hi, and welcome to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer, and today I have with me Mike Maloney. He is the CEO and president of Coda Longboards. Um, but before we get into that, all this week we're talking creative industries, and so the theme here is that we have these people that join us that have really cool businesses that they've created, but not without a great background to help um, get those interesting industries created, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Mike, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I did want to mention real quick, so CEO and president of Coda Longboards, which mm -hmm. we will definitely get into. Um, but right now, let's start with your background. We had some off-air talk about, you know, that you're in the military. You definitely have some aviation background, which we bonded over as, you know, I'm a part-time <laughs> flight attendant. So, right. yeah, jump in wherever you want to with your background, and I will pick your brain from well, there. Well, I, I think it's so <laughs> apropos because uh, to go through the tumultuous uh, path of my career, it all culminates in what CODA stands for and means as a brand. So I, I grew up in Fort Collins, uh, went to CU, got an engineering degree back in the mid-'80s when we were in a recession that was equally as deep, if not deeper, than the one we just went through. And uh, got out of college and couldn't find a job. And so I always wanted to fly, uh, and I went into the Navy. There you uh, go. Got incredibly lucky, ended up flying F-14s in the Navy. Nice. Uh, started flying F-14s out of Miramar the summer after Top Gun came out. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> did you have a motorcycle, uh, too? I did not. Oh. No, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Um, talk about being in the right place at the right time. Oh, yeah. Flying Danger the right machine. Zone. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. So I and was lucky enough to be selected to go to Top Gun yeah. um, about 1992. Mm -hmm. um, so had a wonderful Navy career. I mean, I really... Um, I uh, loved every minute of it, but as you'll see as a kind of a recurring theme in my career, um, you know, I was rushing the Blue Angels, I was looking at test pilot school, space program, wow. you know, the whole nine yards, and then uh, we had a mishap in our squadron, and one of our pilots was killed, oh. and um, essentially there was uh, a cover-up that I was aware of, uh, just by circumstance, and by de facto, I became a whistleblower. <laughs> I didn't even know what that meant, but uh, you know, my career came to an immediate screeching halt yeah. uh, when that happened, and uh, you know, which was confusing to me because the entire essence of being a naval officer was to hold ourselves to a higher standard, and uh, that's what I was doing. But it was kind of strange because I was like, "Wow, I had this great career going, and then all of a sudden, I'm out yeah. on the street." And I, well. Okay, didn't expect that to happen, but that's fine. Were you honorably discharged? I was. That look on your paperwork. Okay. No, I was. Interesting. Yeah, our, uh, our commanding officer was uh, trying to cover up the causal factors for the accident. And I'm like, look, I'm not playing that game. Yeah. Um, you know, this is something that happened, and I'm not going to make a judgment whether these were causal factors for this uh, accident or not. But this is important for the safety board to know. And so, boom. Yeah, how do we fix what's wrong if we don't <laughs> well, talk about the yeah. reality of what's wrong, right? But, yeah, as a junior officer in the Navy, you're going to lose that battle every time, or so I found out. Yeah. So, uh, But, you know, and I can sleep at night because, you know, I uh, maintain my integrity throughout. And uh, But, you know, all of a sudden your whole life changes. And you're like, okay, well, what do I do next? Yeah. I've never been one to lament about what happened in the past. It's just, okay, well, where do I go now? Mm -hmm. um, and I just love Colorado, so I decided to come back here. Ended up getting an MS in finance at DU. Uh, and, gee, started my own financial services company, <laughs> all this stuff. Um, but, uh, I mean, I was totally broke. And yeah. I went to the mailbox one day, and there was a letter from United Airlines. They said, you want to pay me how much money to fly an airplane? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, knew, you know, I really never wanted to be an airline pilot. Uh, it was not something that um, I did it because it was convenient. As I'm fond of saying, it was fun and it was lucrative, and then it became neither. 
Yeah. And, uh, you well, know, I... And I would imagine, right, you're flying F-14s. Those go fast. Yeah. It's, it's uh, a little bit I different. I do better upside down than right side up. But. Exactly. Well, uh, yeah, and that's we have a lot of military pilots that mm -hmm. <laughs> feel that same way. Yeah, but it was, you know, it's a much different atmosphere, as you know, yes. than you expect even going and being a professional pilot. But... Um, you know, and then as you and I talked about before the show, uh, on September 11th, I was a captain at United. I had been an instructor at our training center, and uh, for all intents and purposes, I was probably, you know, a couple months away from going back into the training center as an FAA check airman and a standards captain. Yeah. And all of a sudden, September 11th. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually on the runway, 6 o'clock in the morning in Santa Barbara, um, cleared for takeoff. It just run up the throttles, the full thrust, released the brakes, started rolling down the runway, and towers started screaming at us to abort our takeoff. Oh, that gives me chills. Yeah, it was an interesting day. Um, but, I mean, I, I'll tell you what, i got to give kudos to my first officer. He, I could not have been flying with a better individual or pilot that day. And, uh, you know, he ended up getting furloughed, which is really sad. But he, uh, uh, I was so lucky to have his name was Norbert uh, so lucky to have him in the cockpit with me and you know we uh, uh, you know the whole world changed after that professionally mm -hmm. you know culturally psychologically um, but you know uh, United eventually went into bankruptcy I think in 2003 and what people really don't realize is that we lost everything yeah. You know, I mean, we lost our entire pension. We were you know, primarily ESOP shareholders. Mm -hmm. When the company went to bankruptcy, the stock went to zero. We lost all of our pension. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I, I had a one-year-old at home, and I kind of oh. walked into my wife, and I just said, you know what? I never wanted to do this in the first place, so I'm going to quit. Yeah. And testament to the quality of my wife. First words out of her mouth were, all right, what do you want to do next? Yeah. And um, so... Again, uh, you know, here you are. Starting over. Uh, starting over. Yeah. With the young and one I'm like, look, too. I'm not looking backwards. Um, I'm going to just say, what, what skill sets do I have that would be valuable out in the marketplace? And um, I got incredibly lucky. Um, so I had done a stint in naval intelligence um, in the reserves while I was flying. And so if you looked at everything on my resume except being an airline pilot, I mean, I was actually, you know, I had an engineering degree. Uh, military experience, um, intelligence experience, MS in finance, started my own financial services company, which was small, mm -hmm. but, you know, it was always profitable. And uh, uh, I approached the CEO of CH Toom Hill, mm -hmm. if you know CH. We do know CH yeah. Toom, yeah. And uh, my wife had worked for him um, in the past before we were married, and so I knew him. Mm -hmm. And I just said to my wife, I said, look, you know, Ralph is one of the most senior guys I know. I need to just get out there and start networking, so I'm going to write him an email. And I had heard that they were trying to do some stuff in homeland defense and infrastructure security. And I'm like, hey, you know what? Maybe I could help them there. And uh, so I wrote him an email, and uh, as Ralph would do, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm my thinking, I'm like, I'll wait a few weeks and I'll ping him again and, you know, I'll play that game. No. Nick walked down to my office the next morning, and boom, I have an email from Ralph. <laughs> And he says, hey, I think it's a good idea. You're leaving the airline. I really want to talk to you. I'm going to pull you in and have you talk to some of our executives, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, That's exciting. Yeah, I ended up, it took me two and a half years to get the job. But what eventually happened was. Um, I'm sorry. I got it. Yeah. Why two and a half years? That's, that's an interesting, that piqued well, my interest for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if you want to know more of the story. So uh, <laughs> I started talking to um, the then vice chairman. Okay. He took me to lunch and he said, look, I see your email to Ralph here and your resume and all this stuff about Homeland Defense, infrastructure security. He's like, look, forget all that stuff. He's like, I got bigger plans for you. So um, what eventually happened was they had, um, CH2M Hill back in 1946 had been founded off of being one of the most innovative and technology centric engineering consulting firms in the in that genre yeah you know of companies and um they always had proprietary technology that they brought to their clients and then in the you know 80s late 70s and and through the mid 80s they went dramatically into superfund site cleanup 
which is all, at least at the time, was all U.S. federal government work. So okay. DOD, DOE, or EPA. And on the spectrum of conflict Sorry, of interest. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt again, but yeah. we do need to say, say the oh, acronym. Department of Defense. Thank you. Department of Energy yeah. or Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and on the spectrum of conflict of interest with a consulting engineer having proprietary technology, boy, I'll tell you, the U.S. federal government defines the extreme end where they say, look, if I hire you as a consulting engineer, I demand impartiality, and you can't be impartial if you're bringing proprietary technology to the table. Which, you know, I mean, you can argue all day long whether that's smart or not, but, yeah. you know, what ended up happening is that in the mid-80s, CH was essentially forced to sell off all of their technology. In fact, there are some really substantial companies out there that were founded off of technology coming out of CH Stone Hill at the time. Wow. So in the next 15 years, though, CH Stone Hill exploded onto the international scene. Yeah. I think they went from, you know, Something like a uh, thousand employees to twenty-seven thousand, and I think seven hundred million in revenue to six billion. Yeah, and it's quite uh, a leap. <laughs> yeah, just a bit of a growth spurt, all under Ralph um, as CEO. Uh, and yet, when you go into international, uh, your risk is higher, your margins start to get um, suppressed, and uh, you know, in the early two thousands, they were seeing a significant erosion of their profit margin, and so. Ralph decided that, look, you know, even though the dollar amount of our federal revenue has gone up, it declined back below 30% of their revenue mix. And anyone international, government or, or industry, they couldn't care less about impartiality. They want to hire you to get access to your technology. So he said, look, systemically, we're relieved of this conflict of interest issue to, the great, to a great extent, but, and we need a new profit center. We need to figure out how to monetize our technology. So in walks this fighter pilot, right? <laughs> and he says, okay, you think you're so smart. You know, write me a business plan for how to do this. And so I wrote him a business plan. And uh, apparently they liked it. Uh, they didn't tell me, but <laughs> they liked it. And they were out there trying to hire somebody to come in and do it. And they went through a couple. That's why it took two and a half years. Oh, okay. And so uh, I just kept, I was stayed at United throughout that time. So I was still employed. But I... Uh, I just kept badgering them well, saying, yeah. well, hey, I wrote the business plan. Why don't you just hire me? You know, and so <laughs> finally events just, you know, they kind of merged. And uh, I met an incredible gentleman who worked for ch 2 Hill. Uh, he was the former director of Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, he had been a state alderman for California, the mayor of Livermore. Uh, Gib Margeth, uh was is you know, passed away, unfortunately, uh, but, um, boy, he taught me so much. Talk about a mentor, but Gib and Ralph or somebody in there decided that, you know, it was time to hire me. Yeah. And so I went in there in early 2005, and uh, you know, I remember talking to Ralph for the first time. I think they put my office about 15 feet outside of his door. <laughs> if I had butcher paper, I would have blacked out the window. <laughs> And I used to sit in my office in those first couple of days going, you know, I have absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do here. And uh, so, you know, Ralph, uh, you know, pulled me aside and he said, look, uh, you know, I want this to seep into the company. And I'm like, oh, that's code. I've run a black op before. I know exactly what you're talking about. And <laughs> he said, yeah, well, 26,000 of the 27,000 people in this firm think what I'm about to have you do is illegal. I mean, gee, would you, do you want to tell me that before I quit United Airlines? You yeah. Know? I mean, really. <laughs> but I mean, I understood what he was talking about. He's like, he was telling me, look, I want you to fly under the radar. You're going to get a lot of resistance from a lot of people, mm -hmm. but we've got to figure this out. So, okay. So you do what, you know, there's a distinct thing that you're trained to do in the military as a fighter pilot, particularly in the Navy. And that's it. If you don't like the paradigm, change something, put something in motion that's unexpected and see where what happens. Hmm. And that's uh, better than the status quo. Yeah. And so I just started walking around, started talking to people, knock on president of some division's office and say, hey, you know, tell me about the technology that you see that's valuable in, the, in your stovepipe. And what do you think of it? Is there anything we can do with it? You know, like, who who are you and what do you do? People love to have their opinions <laughs> asked, though, right? Yeah. That's, I, it's number one way to get people to talk about themselves. Well, exactly. Yeah. And so we, 
very quickly, Ralph kind of gave me a 15-year timetable. You know, five years to find all the technology and organize a pipeline. Uh, five years to then, um, you know, essentially what I was doing was advancing these technologies to a nearly commercialized state or a commercialized state, leveraging client projects internally. Then most of them were operating, required operating companies around, and they were out of core business, you know, sales and distribution. CH Tomail doesn't do that. Uh, uh, manufacturing, don't do that. Uh, raw commodity yeah. chemical supply, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I needed to wrap operating company. We did have some where we retained proprietary control over the technology, and the expectation is that we would uh, license those out for royalty and license fees, and, and that would maximize the return on investment on that side of the portfolio. But most of these really needed to be outside of CH2M Hill. So what I would do is find a management team, wrap an operating company around these technologies, go out and try and externally finance them with venture capital, put management in place, come back in, do it again. Okay. And on the back side, the key was that CH2M Hill was the path to market because we could convince our clients that this was the right technology for their project and they would become the early adopter and paying client for that technology, incredibly important in the startup world. So. You know, if I wasn't an entrepreneur and a startup guy then, I sure was after. Yeah. And um, even though I was under the umbrella of a major corporation, but um, I always reported to the vice chairman. Mm -hmm. And uh, jurisdictionally, you know, even though I was tried to be open and honest with the chief legal counsel and the chief financial officer, you know, they're like, hey, you can't hire an investment banker. I'm like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was painful, but I'm like, you know, uh, I actually don't report to you. Yeah. And so if you got a problem with that, you really got to talk to Ralph. Yeah. As chairman of the board, because I, I report to the board, you know, and uh, they didn't like that. So there was always some There's always resistance. internal friction yeah. there. But, uh, you know, by year two, we were already doing equity deals. I mean, we had we were so far ahead of schedule. Right. And yeah, I got to tell you, I got to be perfectly honest with you. I had no clue where that was going to go. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea what the timetable really was. I had yeah. no idea how it was going to manifest itself. Nor Ralph didn't either. Hey, um, worth a shot, though, right? Well, and that's the thing. It's like, look, you know, here's the goal. Just focus on the goal and and figure out if we can get it done. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was like wildcatting. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff where I'm just sitting there going, I have no idea what to do next, so let's just do something. Yeah. And uh, let's see where it, where it goes. But, you know, uh, Gib was just central to all that. He uh, ended up leaving and going to Enroll during all that, but we remained great friends. And uh, he was such a, uh, an experienced uh, guy and mentor in that. I had a really good support network around me. And then, you know, after a couple of years, they turned over all the intellectual property management to me. I don't even think I could spell intellectual property when I went into the firm, and I should probably have an honorary law degree at this point. Um, that That's a whole different world, you know, patents and trademarks. Mm -hmm. and um, But it was so rich. I mean, talk about a rebound coming out of United. Absolutely. And yeah, so, you were looking at, at literally being furloughed, trying to find work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And who, whoever would have figured yeah. that I would wind up there doing that. Exactly. Well, and so, you know, in uh, early 2008, I started reporting to a new vice chairman and a remarkable guy, and a guy named Don. And, uh, you know, he kind of knew who I was, but had no real idea what my function was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember talking to him. I had a deal in play. Um, and, uh, you know, after about two hours, I think his jaw was just on the floor. <laughs> and he was like, wow, I'd heard we were trying to do something like this, but I had no idea you'd gone this far with it. He said, I'm from the old days when we used to make money hand over fist with our technology. You know, what do you need from me? I'm totally in. And I said, well, you know, here's what I need. Um, I'll go and close this deal, and I'll put management in place. And But before I come back in and do any other deals, we need to... We need to legitimize this operation. I need clean jurisdictional control over what I do. So let's roll out my operation into a wholly owned subsidiary of CH2M Hill. And, um, you know, we can offshore it. We're a multinational. We don't have to repatriate the money. We need to, uh, you know, we have a intellectual property portfolio that over time should be generating material income for this company. And, 
you know, we need to offshore it in the Cayman Islands, Ireland, Switzerland, the Netherlands, because that's what everybody does. People don't know, right. but Apple and IBM. It's very common practice. Yeah. You buy an Apple product, 90% of the revenue goes to a holding company in Dublin, Ireland, mm -hmm. and they don't pay any income tax. I mean, you kind of look at it and say, hey, I'd be derelict in my responsibility to the shareholders of this company if I voluntarily paid 38 cents on the dollar to the federal government when there's an alternative to avoid that. Absolutely. So, well, that's why tax reform was so important. Well, and I'm like, yeah, you want to fix that, mm -hmm. get rid of the income tax on intellectual property, you yeah. know, and you'll have trillions of dollars repatriated right into this here. country. Right here, yeah. So, but, you know, uh, uh, so then I said, you know, it's 2008, you know, the economy stinks right now, and, you know, uh, worst case, um, I can't fund this deal. Best case, I'm leaving too much equity on the table anyway. Right. And so even though it's a bad economy, we're a $6 billion Goliath in this industry. Let's go out and raise a strategic fund. We were targeting 300 to $500 million. And that way I'm fully capitalized. I have ready access to capital and we go. Mm -hmm. I can probably fund my entire operation just off of interest on that money from the portfolio. Yeah. And so, you know, Ralph had originally, you know, five years to organize the pipeline, five years to initially populate the deals, and then five years for those initial deals to mature to exit. And then his expectation was a mere $45 million annually Mere. in yes. after-tax <laughs> after profit. I'm just going, oh, man, 10 or 20 might be reasonable. I said, well, I just need a bigger portfolio then, right? But we could have done it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we had a pretty elaborate plan. It was, uh, it, I'm, it was very elegant. But Ralph uh, and Don talked about it, and one of the quotes that I was told was Ralph was like, this is exactly where I knew this was going to go. And I always laugh about that. None of us knew that was where it was going to go. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was always pretty funny whenever I think of that. But uh, that was when Ralph retired. And uh, there was a change of management. The new CEO was... Um, I, and rightly so, I suppose, but he was uh, very concerned about the economy and where it was going, how that would impact the company, was not a technology guy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember the fateful phone call, you know, uh, I'm going to shut down the whole portfolio because it's risky and I don't like risk. And if you can close this deal, I want you to roll as the CEO of this company and uh, protect our equity interest in this one company. Mm -hmm. Like, well, geez, do you want me to walk the 40 feet between your office and my office and explain to you why I do what I do and what it means for this company before you make that decision? No. <laughs> like, wow. Okay. How do we go from Ralph to that in six weeks? It's crazy. Yeah. But it happens, right? It does. Different management styles, yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, well, you're darn right. I'm going to close this deal then. So I closed uh, what essentially was an $8 million Series A in uh, June of 2009, mm -hmm. which we were probably one of only a dozen deals to get done nationwide in 2009. Yeah. Uh, and I rolled out as the CEO of this uh, company, which was, we had a powder material that scrubbed mercury emissions from coal flue gas. Fascinating. I can tell you're enthralled. Yes, by I, I, could, well, that's, it's <laughs> I could talk for hours about <laughs> mercury removal from coal flue gas. Don't get me started. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was heady. We were... Um, it was a chemical material, and uh, we had we were going from lab scale to 500 megawatt power plants and things. And uh, you know, it we had failures. We had to retool. We had to go back out to the market. And then in early 2011, we hit an absolute grand slam in the marketplace. Um, and I walk in the boardroom of the venture capitalists, say, "Hey, thanks for teeing us up. We got a new CEO. See you later." Wow. <laughs> oh, no. Well, with that. And that, that brings me to Coda. So. Which is wonderful. Yeah. Perfect timing. We're going to go to break real quick. You bet. Be sure to check out this podcast at cobrt.com slash live. And uh, other radio shows at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast. We'll be right back. Stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Connect and Collaborate. I am Alex Hopkins, your on-air producer. All week long, we've been talking creative industries, and we're very excited to have with us Mike Maloney today. He is the CEO and president of Coda Longboard. And so, Mike, we were just talking in the last uh, segment here about 
your extensive background, which was fascinating. Um, but I got tripped up a little bit on the, the mercury <laughs> removal. Um, so I just, I, you know what? I Visually speaking, I'm going to need you to explain that just a little bit for me. Well, so, look, there's so much misunderstanding of coal. Um, yeah. I don't want to anger anybody but you know look coal's in a, a vitally important part of our energy mix uh, trust me if it's not grown it's mined yeah trust me folks yeah. we're going to need all of it yes and so don't just don't take sides we're going to need all of it i yeah. can tell you that right now so how do we burn coal cleaner and yeah. we, we burn it incredibly cleanly today but right. there are a couple issues but you know you take a lump of coal what is coal right Coal is biomass. Yeah. It's just been under a billion years of heat and pressure, so it's black. Mm -hmm. But the uh, amount of energy per mass is colossally higher than any other form of biomass. So, But it's just biomass. You can't change right. the chemical makeup of, of it. It's a tree. It's yeah. a plant. It's a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> it, it is what it is. Right. Um, and so you have certain... You have nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, selenium, mercury, arsenic, and unburnt carbon particulate. Okay. And beyond that, you you're don't really have anything else. Right. right. And so mercury has always been kind of a bugaboo. Um, arsenic and selenium, they uh, become gaseous and they disperse and they don't ever concentrate anywhere uh, okay. above what occurs naturally, right? But mercury is a metal. Yes. It's an element. We can neither, uh, we can never, neither create nor destroy mercury. It is an element, yes. right? But in the temperatures in flue gas, it'll go gaseous. And then as it gets higher in the atmosphere, it'll condense back into a solid and come down with huh. precipitation. And so in some radius around a power plant, it will, over time, concentrate to well above uh, natural levels. So it's important that we scrub it. Okay. So how do you get gaseous mercury? Yeah. Um, prevent that from going out that stack and somehow control it. So we had a, we had a powder material. It was a, uh, a bentonite base. So it was, so one of the other things is that what the byproduct of burning coal is, is fly ash. Yeah. And fly ash is essentially volcanic ash. Okay which was how concrete was invented by the Romans, right? So ah, fly ash. I'm getting a history lesson today. Yeah, this is I mean, amazing. trust me. I history told you I told you not yeah, to ask me about you, this. I, I, you're right. But the, <laughs> uh, so the byproduct of burning coal is coal fly ash, and that creates about 19 to 20% of the world's cement supply. Yeah. And so, however, in certain forms, mercury can become a very potent neurotoxin. If you inhale gaseous mercury, then it becomes a very import, uh, potent uh, neurotoxin to humans. But nobody's living at the top of that stack. Nobody's inhaling gaseous mercury in this case. But when fish and, uh, uh, metabolize mercury, yeah. they metabolize it into methylmercury. And that then you eat the fish and it becomes a neurotoxin. People cannot metabolize it. If you just eat raw mercury, yeah. your body can't metabolize it. It'll go right through. Okay. But in methylmercury, it'll become a neurotoxin. So, and that's how people get sick from yeah, mercury poisoning. So yeah. you look at Chesapeake Bay okay. with a coal power plant. Yeah. And, you know, all the crabs and everything, you know, people eat those, they're going to get, potentially get mercury poisoning. It's a bad thing. Trust well, me. We, we need to control it. Yeah. And so the problem is that the only known methodology for controlling mercury contaminated your fly ash and you yeah. couldn't, it wouldn't cure in concrete. Okay. So our material was the only known, at least, um, at the time, I'm not sure where it is now, but uh, it was the only material that was concrete compatible that could effectively scrub mercury. And the trial that I was talking about, over a 90-day trial at full scale, the EPA target was 92% mercury removal. We had 95% mercury remov removal every second of every day wow. over a 90-day trial at full scale. Yeah. And then I get thrown out of the company. <laughs> oh no yeah and then they said thanks went through all the things yeah. made sure it was sustainable like all right good luck boys all right you know? so all right let's start from there then i guess so we've left we did all this great work we've got what are we doing next so at the time i was 50 years old 2011 49 you're and, like i didn't uh, want to start over again yeah but i mean you know you're just i was like well i've, I've got a pretty good resume but I came out of there and I'm going, holy crap, I did not know this economy was in such bad shape. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was in all these C-level networking groups and the ranks were swelling to like 300 people. 
and all very talented, very successful yeah. people. None of us were old enough or wealthy enough to retire. And one by one, I start watching these very talented folks slip into divorce, foreclosure, personal bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And I went to my wife and I said, look, two things are happening here. Number one, we're all stuck in this paradigm. We're going to get back the job we just lost. Look at this group of people. Oh, yeah. Those jobs don't exist anymore. And it may take them 10 years to come back. They'll probably come back at a third of the comp level. Mm -hmm. So nobody's going to hire me at the age of 60. I haven't sat on the sidelines for 10 years. I said, the second thing that's happening is that all of us, every dollar that comes out of our checking account, we're becoming more and more risk averse. Mm -hmm. I said, as hard as this is going to be for us, every dollar that leaves our checking account, we better become more risk tolerant because we darn well better take the risk while we can afford to Absolutely. instead of me hooking a IV of Starbucks to my arm and power networking my way into nothing for five years and then saying, hey, maybe we ought to start a company mm -hmm. and we don't have the money to do it. So uh, for a while, I was trying to buy some of the technologies out of CH2M Hill. I mean, still to this day, they're now Jacobs, but I'm the only one that knows where all that technology is over there. It's all sitting there collecting dust. There's some incredible stuff over there. Mm -hmm. And I could have done it, but I would have needed 30 to 50 million to get any of it to market. And there was definitely no yeah. uh, tolerance for that kind of an investment in 2011, 2012. So, uh, you know, I live by DU. And uh, I don't know if you remember what Jordan's Pub. wish it was still there. I don't. Right on the corner of Evans and University great place and I was waiting for a networking meeting to start feeling really sorry for myself drinking a beer looking out the window now I feel like network meetings are just an excuse to drink with people in suits is that yeah or is, or yeah. you know communal misery <laughs> yeah. right exactly <laughs> yeah but um all of a sudden I see these co-eds go by on longboard skateboards and I was looking out the window all alone feeling sorry for myself. And I noticed first thing is that they all sagged and almost hit the ground. You know, I, somewhere in my past, I've got an engineering degree. Why is nobody cambering those boards? I mean, camber, which is the upward bow. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a simple engineering mechanism, but yeah. it, you look at any high performance downhill ski, they're all cambered and that's intentionally done for yeah. turning performance. Right. Science. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, that just bugs me. It was almost a visceral reaction. <laughs> looking at these things, you know, hey, mental note, you ever decide to make a longboard skateboard, camber it. And then I sat there long enough saying, you know, old fighter pilot thing. I'm not in a very good place right now. And so maybe I ought to just shake my life up and put something in motion that nobody would expect. So maybe I just buy one of those things and uh, start riding it. Do something that nobody would expect me to do <laughs> at the age of 50. And then I immediately thought what everybody else thinks. If I got on that thing, I would kill myself. Yep. But I sat there long enough saying, why, why do I think that? We do all sorts of dangerous things at my age. We ski, we tear ACLs, mm -hmm. we mountain bike, we break collarbones. I've laid down my road bike on the Platte River Trail. Oh. Put on coat and tie over severe road rash before. <laughs> so let me flip that around. Why wouldn't I get on that thing? And it really came down to the fact that I have absolutely nothing in common with the skateboard culture. There's nothing there culturally or stylistically that appeals. And I went back to camber, you know, camber is the mechanism that allows me to control my speed. And the only thing I'm afraid of is I don't want to get on something where I think it's a fait accompli. I'm going to hurt myself, but mm -hmm. uh, I would, if I were a betting man, <laughs> I would bet that camber would work exactly like it does in a downhill ski on something on wheels. Yeah. And it does. So um, one thing led to another, and I said to my wife, you know, uh, I got to do something, so I'm just going to start making these things and see what happens. I don't think it'll bankrupt us. Yeah, I'm still trying to make good on that promise. <laughs> um, and so I started making longboard skateboards out of my driveway, wow. and people started buying them. And I thought, wow, you know, we've actually got something here. And uh, so that was in... May of 2012, by 2013, about March, we had moved into a commercial factory. Um, but I realized early on that uh, we have a brand on our hands. So COTA, K-O-T-A, stands for Knights of the Air. I love that. Yeah, Knights of the Air goes all the way back to World War I, the dawn of aviation. Um, the history behind that is that, uh, you know, what people don't understand is that in 1914, the airplane was only 11 years old. I mean, the Wright brothers flew the first powered flight in 1903. Mm -hmm. And the Europeans are looking at this contraption saying, you know, what in the world are we going to do with this thing and who are we going to get to fly it? 
and they generally pulled officers from the Cavalry Corps and taught them how to fly. They became the world's first fighter pilots. But at the time, officers in the Cavalry Corps could trace their lineage back to the medieval knights. And so they lived literally by the chivalric code. That was their culture. And so uh, there was a French magazine in 1914 that was doing an expose on a French ace, and they traced his lineage back to Joan of Arc or somebody, and yeah. dubbed him a knight of the air. <laughs> and that was a moniker that stuck amongst all the pilots on all sides of the conflict. And there are all sorts of anecdotal uh, stories that um, exhibit this code of honor, integrity, courage, esprit de corps, uh, even amongst adversaries mm -hmm. in, this, um, in this culture. And it, it was, to me, still the defining culture of fighter aviation when I was flying F-14s in the Navy. And uh, thus, <laughs> why I was not willing to blow or to... Uh, go along with something that I thought was less than truthful. Yeah. Um, and so after my experience with the venture capitalists at uh, Novinda, which was just left just such a, a horrible taste in my mouth, yeah. um, I was like, you know what, I'm going to start a brand and it's going to stand for holding ourselves to a higher standard. We are going to elevate the discourse about how we treat one another in business, in our society, and it's all going to be about honor, integrity, mutual respect, understanding, communication, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in essence, holding ourselves to a higher standard in all that we do every day. And that's going to be infused into our product. It's going to be infused into our brand. It's going to be infused into the way we conduct ourselves in the marketplace. And so we started this company understanding that we also have a brand on our hands. And uh, so not only do we have a beautifully handcrafted product right here in Ruby Hill, um, which is a fantastic neighborhood, up-and-coming neighborhood in Denver, um, right by, we're only half a block off of Levitt Pavilion, the nice. new amphitheater yeah. in uh, Ruby Hill, and um, have a fantastic factory. Uh, moved out of Rhino, it's just too expensive. Oh and, yeah, it uh, blew up Yeah, recently. it really did. Yeah. And, uh, but we landed in a great place. Nice. And, uh, but our demographic is, you know, we start about where the skate shop ends. So the official demographic of a longboard skateboard is age 9 to 24, 93% male. Our demographic is really the young professional, late 20s, early 30s, all the way to the retiree in their 60s, sometimes even their 70s. Mm -hmm. and, but the heart of our market's about 35 to 55, 40% women. Wow. And so we reflect the mainstream action sports market, the fitness lifestyle market, the surf lifestyle market, mm -hmm. the craft brewery market. Yeah. You know, it's a big um, one here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you're driving into a part of our economy that is always looking for some new piece of gear to uh, work with or to bring into their lifestyle. They're uh, motivated primarily by value, quality, and brand. Yeah. And that's where we are. That's the heart of, of who we are. Uh, the real leap of faith was, though, how many of them would actually adopt longboarding as something that they do in an active lifestyle. Yeah. And uh, we no longer ask our, ourselves <laughs> that question. No. We know that that market is out there. We know that with our brand and our product, they will respond, and they'll bring that into their lifestyle regimen. The biggest issue for us right now is um, that reach. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we are now in our sixth year. Um, Congratulations. Happy thank anniversary. You. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next month, actually, the 17th of May. Yeah. Um, we uh, are in affectionately what's called the valley of death for a startup where we're growing, but we have to self-finance the growth. We're always out of cash. Yeah. We're trying to raise capital in any way that we can. Uh, we really don't need that much, but uh, comparatively, but uh, one of the... <laughs> Uh, one of my colleagues, a couple of my colleagues at CH2M Hill are actually shareholders in the company. And uh, several of my Navy colleagues are shareholders and United colleagues. But uh, uh, one of my CH2M Hill uh, colleagues that invest in the company looked at me and he's just like, you are brutally efficient with capital. <laughs> like, well, we pride ourselves on that because yeah. I've been on the other side. And... Uh, that is a compliment, though, for well, sure. Well, it is. I, I wear yeah. that very proudly. Good, you and, should. And uh, so I would, I would uh, challenge anybody to build what we've built in six years on less than three or four times the amount of money that we've put into this company. But we still need capital to operate. And uh, what the Valley of Death represents, and we're not the only one, 
we talked to all the other wonderful manufacturing startups in this city and state, and uh, all of us are suffering from the same thing. We're at that growth curve where we have to pay all of our vendors up front, but as we land bigger and bigger clients, they want to get 30, 60 day terms on the backside. It's called your cash conversion cycle. Mm -hmm. And right now, even though you want to do everything you can to shrink that, it's now expanding. And yeah. it expands on every company in our situation. Until we get to profitability and have the clout to demand terms from our vendors, and we can, then we can't, we have no way really to collapse that cash conversion cycle. And uh, you don't have debt instruments really available to you to finance that, so you have to self-finance it. And, um, you know, it's, it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, which is why you need investment capital to do it. But we're probably, if we can get fully capitalized in the next couple months, I mean, we're just coming into the season, we need to do it quickly. Mm -hmm. But if we can do it uh, and we can capture this summer season and fall season and then go into Christmas, which is our strongest selling season, uh, we could be profitable within 12 to 18 months. You know, yeah. I would probably say more on the 18 month side, but we could be closing that, that uh, burn rate gap within 12, 18 months. But we've got to have marketing capital. We've got to have the capital to self-finance that uh, conversion cycle, cash conversion cycle, and we've got to have the runway to know that we're not going to be wondering how am I going to make payroll next week, you yeah. know? And that's, uh, you're right there. You're just, we're, <laughs> we're so close, so close. But it's always a struggle. And yeah. like I say, we're not unique. It's a struggle to all companies mm -hmm. in this situation. What, what kind of market are you looking at to be investors? Well, we, typically angels. Trust me, I'm not getting venture capital <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, angel investors, strategic partners. Um, you know, we, we need angels who we have a couple and one in particular who is connected and can open up markets for us. Uh, any angel investor that can open up markets into not necessarily retail, retail's mm -hmm. kind of really suppressed right now and they're suffering, but, you know, open up direct channels, open up co-brand partners. One of the things that's important to the company is that uh, we're the only skateboard out there that doesn't need grip tape. Ooh. And, uh, you know, my CTO at my last company is a PhD chemist. I pulled him out of Wacker, which is yeah. a German lacquer and finish company. Yeah. So he and I are great friends. And I called him up and I said, Mike, could you ever develop a clear, non-porous finish that would be grippy to crepe and rubber-soled skin and sh uh, shoes and skin? He laughs. It's like, like a mistake we make in the lab. What do you want that for? <laughs> and I told him, you're doing what? You're an energy sector guy. You're doing what? Yeah. I'm like, one board skateboards, man. Just don't worry about it. Deal with He's it. Like, this is where I'm at. <laughs> I'm on it. And uh, so we ended up, we have this proprietary uh, grip finish. No pores, no particulate. But that allowed us to bring the primary art surface to the top of the board. Mm -hmm. So all oh, of a sudden, yeah. we have co-brand partners. Epic Brewing, um, who I love. Up I, in, you know, one of my favorites. Yep, great people up there. They were our first co-brand partner. Uh, Dave Cole came to me and said, hey, uh, you know, can we co-brand with you? And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> no. And, yeah. uh, you know, we've made a few boards for him. We made a lot of tap handles for him out of our waste wood, which we do. But... Uh, uh, they were our first co-brand partner, and since then, Halcyon Hotel rents our boards to their guests out of Cherry Creek. They're part of Sage Hospitality. Um, we've done boards for almost all the Vale resorts, Heavenly Valley, Kirkwood, North Star, Vale. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. Subaru, Camelback, 511 Tactical. Um, we just picked up an open-ended um, agreement with Anheuser-Busch. Nice. And, uh, you know, we're doing Budweiser right now. We're working with Landshark, hoping to pick up anywhere from, you know, Elysian, 10 Barrel, Stella even. Yeah. Um, Golden Road. They're all in play um, mm -hmm. if we can just convince them that this is a really good promotional product for them. So, uh, and then uh, we really de-emphasized retail after chasing retailers for three or four years and not getting anywhere. We de-emphasized retail and then all of a sudden we get a call from Shields. I'd been trying to get the number for the hard goods buyer at Shields for years. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he emailed me and he says, uh, hey, we're opening up this store in Johnstown and we want to carry your brand. Since September, they placed, I think, seven recurring orders for our product. They're That's turning impressive. over product. Yes. We've, we've expanded since February into six additional Shields locations. So we're in seven stores now. 
And they bought, we just launched an electric board, which we think could really skyrocket our revenue for 2018 and beyond. Uh, and they bought the first six of those units. They've only had them for a few weeks, so hopefully those will move. Now, I'm definitely a neophyte when it comes to skateboarding in general, but an, ele mm -hmm. an electric skateboard, an electric longboard. Yeah, and so I was kind of reluctant to do it. Yeah. Um, I'll try and make this quick, but uh, <laughs> we had a client who's got a number of our boards, and he came to us and said, look, I love the ride of your boards, but I'm really into these electrics now. Yeah. But none of them ride like your boards, so could I take one of the motors off of one of my electrics and put it on your board? I knew someone was going to make me do this sooner or later, and I, I really didn't want to do Inevitable, it. Inevitable, yeah. And uh, I really thought that the big battery would interfere with the camber and flex of our boards, which is paramount to their performance the and rideability. behind it, yeah. But when we did it, it was astonishing. Not only did it not impact the camber and the flex of the board, but the difference between our product and those other high-end electric boards was astonishing yeah and so I started I sat down with our team and I said look where is this market going and what I essentially what we understood was that just about all the big players in the electric board market boosted evolve inboard all of those they're battery companies they've done a remarkable job miniaturizing the battery powering a longboard skateboard with a really unique dri drivetrain and all that but then they just put a big slab on the top of it and it's just like every other you know thing it's basically we just put a substrate on there and then motorized it well we I, I'm gonna paraphrase because they built the Ferrari motor mm -hmm. but without the Ferrari chassis suspension and body it's not a Ferrari well we have this chassis suspension and body and I can get best-in-class components mm -hmm. until we can afford to make our own right and we can give you the entire package so our approach to that market is kind of the exact opposite of the current players in the market. They're all about taking something and motorizing it. We're all about, look, you've matured this market, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. What we look at is how do our clients want to use this product and how does it fit within their lifestyle? And let's not just motorize our board, let's give them the lifestyle experience that they're looking for. We really think that we're just getting going. I think we've delivered maybe about 20 of these. And, That's uh, awesome. You know, but that could be explosive. That's way more disruptive in the marketplace than our non-electric boards. Absolutely. So before we wrap up here, mm -hmm. tell me how I can be an investor and how I can buy one of these longboards. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can come and see us in our showroom. You can go on to www.cotalongboards, K-O-T-A, longboards, with an S on the end, uh, yeah. dot com. Um, you can order an electric now on our website as of uh, got that done on the weekend. Yes. And... Uh, we do have an active WeFunder campaign going on right now. It's kind of stalled out a little bit on us for some various reasons, but we're still on the hunt on that. Um, for as little as 250 bucks, you can go in and invest in the company. Nice. Become an affiliate on the backside of that. Uh, actually self-induce a dividend by driving people to buy our product and things like that. But, uh, you know, or we're taking direct investment from investors, um, larger dollar investors. So uh, we've got an active deal in play and... Yeah. and uh, you know, uh, we're right there. If we can just capitalize this company. We're we're truly, I know it's cliche, but we're at that tipping point. Well, I hope you get pushed over the edge there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having you on, Mike. Be sure to check out this and more at cobrt.com slash radio dash podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe our YouTube page. We'll see you later.